let's cultivate our motivation. We all have problems, and most of us spend a lot of time thinking about our problems, going around and around in circles about them. But if we look honestly, our problems, first of all, are all about ourselves. And second, they're all about this life. So when you think of the huge universe and countless sentient beings in it, when you think of infinite time in the past, infinite time in the future, then it becomes clear that ruminating about our problems in this life is so narrow. There is so much going on in the universe and we pick out this infinitesimally small part and blow it up to make it enormous. And then we feel miserable, we feel trapped by our situation. We feel confused and angry and entitled to something better. But we don't realize that it's our own mind that is creating all of this. We don't understand how our mind <coughs> plays a role in our experience. And we especially don't understand how our ignorance <coughs> twists, distorts our vision of how things exist. So we're very fortunate to have <coughs> encountered the Buddhist teachings that point these things out to us. And then it's up to us to take the challenge, learn the teachings, apply them to our own experience, start to correct the distortions in our own minds, and put energy into developing our potential and our good qualities. And so this is the reason why we're at the retreat. But let's remember we're not doing this simply for our own benefit. But let's extend and expand our mind and work for the benefit of all beings. And to do that, aim for the fully awakened state. And so let's let this be our motivation for sharing the Dharma now. So, here we are. <laughs> How did we all get here? Yeah. Think of all the causes and conditions from this life and from who knows how many previous lives that led to us all creating the causes to be here in this room at this time. And how many people 
who wanted to be here and then things came up or who knows what's going on interferences are plentiful but somehow we all made it here quite remarkable when you think about it yeah and when you think of uh, how few people especially over the holiday season are uh, intent on creating virtue the holiday season is usually the time for creating as much non-virtue as you possibly can you know and then go to church and think <laughs> that you've purified it <laughs> yeah but it doesn't quite work that way does it yeah So when we talk about our precious human life and our opportunity to uh, learn and practice the Dharma, this is it. This is an example of it. Yeah. And so to really appreciate this opportunity, yeah, because so many people don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> there are people here at the Abbey who are not in this room for one reason or another. Yeah. So let's not take our opportunity for granted and let's really uh, make the most of it and appreciate our lives. Now, we often don't appreciate our lives, do we? We spend a huge amount of time feeling sorry for ourselves yeah, because we have so many problems, feeling entitled to something better that the universe somehow hasn't treated us fairly. And yet, two things here. First of all, we're more fortunate than most living beings on this planet at this time. And second of all, we're the ones who created the causes for our fortune and misfortune. So why are we feeling entitled or disgruntled when the whole thing is sourced in our own mind and our own thoughts and our own behavior? And when you think of the amount of time we spend grumbling what if we use that time to transform our minds and apply the antidotes to our ignorance and anger, attachment and jealousy and arrogance? Yeah, what would happen if we used all that time that we spend grumbling uh, and instead put it into, you know, transforming our mind? and generating our good qualities. That would be really something, wouldn't it? Yeah. So the possibility is there. Yeah. And, the, and uh, we just have to take the possibility. And when our mind grumbles, look and ask ourselves, you know, where did this situation originate from? And how am I regarding it right now? It originated from our previous attitudes and our actions of body, speech, and mind. And our present attitudes and emotions keep the whole thing going yeah, because we experience a hindrance and then we get angry so that just keeps the whole cycle going doesn't it yeah instead of okay here's a hindrance I'm so glad this karma is ripening now it's finished and over 
it's not going to oppress me anymore. And compared to it ripening in a lower rebirth, my problem in this life is nothing. Yeah? Wouldn't you say your problems in this life are virtually nothing when compared to a lower rebirth? Even a good lower rebirth, like our cats, you know, talk about spoiled rotten. <laughs> yeah? Our cats are, you know, they're spoiled rotten. <laughs> Yeah, but they don't have the opportunity to practice the Dharma, even though they're so close. Yeah? So, our, you know, our problem, your work problem, your relationship problem, your this money problem, your whatever problem, yeah? Compared to being born as even one of our cats, your problem is nothing because you can still come here and learn the Dharma. Our cats live here. Very difficult to learn the Dharma. They're so adorable. <laughs> yeah. And we try and teach them and they attend teachings. But they don't get it. <laughs> yeah we, we say just even the first precept don't take life and they turn around and you know paw at an ex insect or chase a mouse when they get out yeah we say don't speak harsh words they hiss at each other. Of course, you do too. <laughs> Except we human beings don't hiss. We, we really go into it. Yeah. Make somebody good and miserable. They at least hiss and chase each other, and that's the end of it. You know? We, you know, our harsh words are carefully planned to inflict the greatest pain possible. And then, even after we've said that, we think of more ways to retaliate. Yeah. So sometimes we don't use our human intelligence very smartly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're going to look at the Vajrasattva practice, you know, why do we do this retreat every New Year's? Yeah. It's because most people think of New Year's as turning over a new leaf. Actually, every minute is the opportunity to turn over a new leaf or turn a new page or whatever it's called. Okay? So... But somehow, you know, in our mind we think, okay, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. Yeah, so we want to, you know, purify all the stuff in the old year so that we can start the new year fresh, forgetting that we can actually do this in each day and each moment. But since society thinks that way, then we do the Vajrasattva practice. So it's interesting with the Vajrasattva because it's all about purification and to purify we have to think about the things that we've done that have been non-virtuous that we don't think that we don't feel so good about. Yeah. And uh, honestly recollect them and regret them. Yeah, change our attitude to some uh, remedial actions, make a determination to avoid these kinds of things in the future. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, what we do at the end of the year with New Year's. Mm -hmm. 
Now, sometimes, and and I should say, you know, all the Buddhist uh, traditions have practices for purification. They do them in a variety of ways. And I think all religions have uh, practices for purification. There's kind of a universal understanding that we make mistakes. Now, sometimes, you know, when doing purification practice, Tibetan tradition, you know, has a lot of these, and we do a hundred thousand of them, plus ten percent, and ten percent of that, and ten percent of that. So you wound up with a hundred and eleven thousand one hundred and eleven. And when you get to that number, you stop. You don't do one more. <laughs> as if we've purified everything by then, <clears throat> were it so, if it could only be like that. And sometimes in the middle of it, uh, people say, well, I've thought of everything I can purify. I don't have anything left to think about. <laughs> well, really? Uh, I can help you think of some things. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, you know, this is important <coughs> because we sometimes gloss over things. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, yeah, okay, I confessed all that. Overdone. Yeah, I thought of Vajrasattva telling me it's purified. He said it once, it must be over and done with. I'm good to go. Yeah, you know, if you have a really dirty piece of cloth, uh, you don't just wash it once. Not everything comes off and out in the first wash. You have to really work at it. So it's the same with our mind. So that's one factor. Another factor is we are often blind to our own non-virtue. Yeah? We uh, don't, we do certain actions and we say, there's nothing wrong with that. Or even worse, oh, that was a virtuous action because <laughs> we're so confused about what's virtuous and what's non-virtuous. So one way that I think is, is good to kind of break through that impasse, uh, well, there's two ways. One is look at the things in your mind, things that happened in the past that you have some disquietude about, some feeling of... Yeah, like that, you know? Like, it hasn't been resolved. It's still something is scratching at you emotionally, mentally. Um, yeah? So those kinds of things that you don't feel at peace about. So that's one way. Yeah? The second way is to listen to teachings and then uh, where a teacher uh, kindly points some of the things out that you should look at that you may never have considered would be non-virtuous. Mm -hmm. So regarding the first of those, the things where we feel a little bit... You know what I mean? Like... Okay, that's the past, but I really haven't made peace with it. Yeah. And it could be a situation where we're not seeing ourselves at this moment as doing anything non-virtuous, but the whole situation is sticky and uncomfortable 
And can you think of something in your life? Yeah. Okay. So these kinds of things, I think, are very helpful to look more at. Yeah. And to really look at and say, okay, this thing happened, you know, whatever it was, some situation, and I don't feel comfortable about it. What is it about the situation that I don't feel comfortable about? And when we ask ourselves that question, the first thing is usually, well, somebody did this and I don't like it. Yeah. Or somebody did this and I didn't know how to respond to it. And so I felt put down or neglected or mistreated or, you know, like that. So it usually starts out this exploration with looking outside for what wasn't comfortable. Okay, so notice that. But don't get caught up in it and don't start ruminating about it, reliving the experience, going over what this person did and that person did, and no, 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 and recreating it so that you're all upset again. Okay? You've done that enough. We've all done that enough. Too many times, actually. Instead, when you look at those things, say, what was my attitude when this was going on? Okay. So maybe you're thinking about a family dinner from Christmas dinner from, you know, 15 years ago or five years ago or whatever. That's supposed to be happy and warm and loving. Yeah, you know? How this supposed to be like on Father's no Father Knows Best. Okay. Yeah. How all those shows. Warm, loving, perfect, all American family. Yeah. Uh, all American family is not exactly like that. <laughs> okay, so there's this Christmas dinner and this was going on and you don't feel comfortable and you're pinpointing what different people said. Okay, then press the pause button and say, how was I feeling? Well, I was hurt by what this one said and I got angry. And I had a lot of negative thoughts towards that person. And maybe a couple of them came out of my mouth. But even if they didn't come out of my mouth, I left the family dinner. Wishing they had come out of my mouth because I'm so... at that person. Okay? There you go. Is there some non-virtue there? Hello? Yes. 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 Okay. Forget what the other person said and did. That's not your business. Look at your own anger. Look at the wish that you that you wanted to really say something and shoot that person down once and for all. Because it's a family dinner after all. So this person hasn't just done that once. You've had numerous family dinners and you have a relationship going back many years with that person. And that person knows how to pu push your buttons. And we get mad at them every time they push our buttons. But their pushing our buttons is their stuff. Our buttons are our stuff. 
So what are my buttons that I have in this relationship with somebody that make me so ego-sensitive when they even look at me a certain way or say a certain thing so that I hear what they're saying but I think they're really saying something else trying to offend me. Okay. So look at what we're contributing to the situation. Okay. Our emotion, our description of the situation, how we wanted to act and maybe did yeah, maybe you got up in the middle of that loving family dinner and threw something or stormed out of the family dinner or who knows what. Yeah. So look at those things. And there's some non-virtue in there. Yeah. There's attachment. There's anger. There's confusion. There's resentment. There's arrogance. <laughs> Yeah. So look at that, and that'll give you some more things to confess and purify. And it's very psychologically helpful to do this because we s begin to see our habit patterns and how we repeatedly misunderstand what someone has said or done. <laughs> or even we understand what they said or did correctly, how we repeatedly get upset by it because we have ego-sensitive buttons. Look also at how, when we start to even look at this, how our defenses go up to ourself. Because we say, but any sane person would be furious if a relative said this to them. Anybody would be upset if this were done to them. I'm just behaving in a normal way like everybody else on this planet does. Yeah, it sounds like a good defense, doesn't it? Yeah, we use it all the time. But do you really want to be like everybody else on this planet? Or do you want to get out of samsara? You know, there's two things to choose from here. <laughs> yeah, I can be like everybody else and nourish my buttons and nourish my grudges. Or I can work to get out of samsara. It's my choice. Yeah, it's my choice. What am I going to do? Yeah. And then you think, well, I've nourished my buttons and I've nourished my resentment and my self-pity and I've nourished my, you know, anger for a long time. And if I don't do something, this whole thing is going to continue, and it could get a lot worse. So, while I have this opportunity, let's at least try and apply the antidotes that we've learned to anger, resentment, self-pity, all these kinds of things, greed, uh, let's at least try and, and apply the antidotes. And then your mind goes, oh, yes, oh, but what are the antidotes? What are the antidotes? I've been going to Dharma teachings for 10 years. I wish they'd teach me the antidotes already. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. I heard something about antidotes, but what, what are the antidotes? What do I, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So then our usual thing is, I'll write a letter to my teacher, and they'll tell me what to do. How about looking at some of your notes from previous courses? How about listening to some things on the on the online? How about trying to remember what you've heard during those ten years? <laughs> because I'm sure there were some antidotes in there somewhere. So pick out one of the antidotes. Or look at working with anger or healing anger or um, an open-hearted life or don't believe everything you think or good karma or <laughs> something, you know? <laughs> It's like, you know, all those books that you, where you proofread the manuscript, but you didn't take any of it in. All you did was, oh, that you need a period there. <laughs> There's a spelling error there, but you didn't remember anything that you read when you were proofreading it. Yeah. So, you know... <laughs> Try and get some of those, and then think about it, yeah, and apply it to your situation, yeah. And, you know, at first the mind is creaky. I mean, you think you have creaky bones? Wait until you, the, the mind is creakier than our body, you know, it's like, uh, let's stretch this mind to consider that maybe I had something to do with this. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then being willing to look at that and try seeing the situation from a different perspective. Hmm? And you have to do this many times, many times. Okay, so many of you have heard my Sam story, right? Who hasn't heard my Sam story? Oh, well, maybe I have to tell my <laughs> Sam story. <laughs> if, because there's three or four people who haven't heard <laughs> what happened after my Sam's story that, that fits in here. But anyway, since you're so eager to hear the story again, <laughs> and since some of you already have it memorized, you can uh, test your memory to see if you know it correctly. Okay, so um, I was a baby nun, and uh, my teacher was... Uh, just starting to set up dharma centers in different parts of the world. And so one day I was eating, drinking a cup of tea at the monastery in Nepal, and one of my teacher's assistants walked past me and said, Oh, Lama thinks it would be very good if you go to, uh, to be the spiritual program court. No, to be gay. No. What is that? I was initially signed to be gaygu of the monks. Okay, the Gago is the disciplinarian. I later became also the spiritual program coordinator. But she said, Lama thinks it would be good if you went to Italy to the Dharma Center to do that, and kept walking, and I was like stunned. <laughs> what? But your teacher asks you to do something, so you do it. So I put on my plastic sandals, and I went to Italy in the middle of winter. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I was put as disciplinarian of the Italian monks. There was one nun, and all the rest were monks. Okay? Um, of all the macho cultures, <laughs> Italy is one of the big ones. Okay? So they, these monks were not too fond of having a nun be their disciplinarian. I was also the spiritual program coordinator working uh, 
with the other people on the committee to run the institute. I was the only woman on the committee. And, uh, and I thought I didn't have a problem with anger. Because I was nice, you know? I was nice. Of course, I got irritated, but I kept my, clout, my mouth closed because women aren't supposed to yell and scream. My mother yelled and screamed, but I didn't want to be like that. So I thought, I don't have a problem with anger. Well, these Italian men decided to show me that I had a problem with anger. And I would uh, get furious at what they did, which I won't recount to you. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me suffice it to say that one of my friends there said that he has a very vivid memory of um, me at, at the Institute walking very quickly somewhere <laughs> with one of those monks running after me. <laughs> yes, so um, yeah, so I had some problems. And I would get angry, and it was all their fault because, I mean, they were so macho and so discourteous, and they picked on me. And, you know, but I had heard enough teachings to know that anger was an affliction and that I needed to do something about it. So I would go home every evening and I would read chapter six of Shanti Deva's text, Engaging in the Bodhisattva's Deeds. And I'd get myself calmed down, and then I would go back into my office the next day, and they had a new surprise waiting for me every day, and I would get so angry and upset. And then I'd go home that evening and meditate on Chapter 6, and this was my cycle, okay, there. And at one point, uh, after some time, I wrote to Lama, and I said, Lama, I'm creating a lot of negative karma here, and it's all their fault, <laughs> and I want to leave. Okay, This was after, not immediately after, a few months after, I mean, just to give you an idea of what happened, where the director of the center said to me, that he called our teacher and told him that I was the biggest hindrance this center could ever have. Okay, so that's one example. Um, <laughs> so I wrote to Lama, I said, Lama, I want to leave, you know, please, uh, they're, they're making me create non-virtue, and uh, can I leave? And Lama said, we'll discuss it. Uh, I'll be there in six months. <laughs> so, uh, my point, okay, one point in telling this story, okay, is that every day I would get angry. Every day I would go read Shanti Deva chapter six and meditate on something that he had taught. And I would get angry the next day. Okay, so my point in telling the story thus far is that you have to repeatedly meditate on these antidotes. It isn't just that we, we do it one time and then our anger is gone. Yeah, or our attachment is gone, <clears throat> or whatever it is. You know, we scratch at something. And we balance our mind out. But because we have such a strong habit with these afflictive emotions, yeah, they aren't uprooted, you know, or even subdued greatly by one application of an antidote. Okay, we have to keep on doing it. Okay, so I'm keeping on doing it. Finally, Lama got there. 
I asked him if I could leave. He said yes, and I was out of there. And I went back to Nepal, uh, and I went to see my other teacher. They, my two teachers were at the same monastery. And I went to see my other teacher. He invited me for tea. So I went up on top of the, the building and, you know, looking out over the peaceful Kathmandu Valley. This was 1975. It's not so peaceful and agrarian now, but at that time it was. And, uh, and uh, Rimche asked me, he said, uh, we'll call the director of the center. He was kind of one of the chief ones who was picking at me, but all of them were. And, and Rimche, we'll call him Sam. So uh, Rimche said, who's kinder to you, the Buddha or Sam? What kind of question is that? Yeah, so I said, the Buddha's kinder to me. Yeah, because the Buddha teaches me the Dharma. The Buddha leads me on the path to awakening. Yeah, the Buddha's kinder. And Rinpoche looked at me. <laughs> Haven't gotten it yet, kid, have you? And then he proceeded to explain to me how Sam was kinder to me than the Buddha. Sam, that beep, 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 jerk, yeah, was kinder than the Buddha. And he said, because if I'm going to become a Buddha, one of the Buddhas of the Ten Perfections that Bodhisattvas practice is fortitude or patience. <clears throat> And in order to develop that, you need somebody who disturbs you. You need an enemy. Without an enemy, there's nobody you can practice fortitude with. And Buddha is not going to be your enemy, Rinpoche explained. So Sam is providing you with the opportunity to uh, practice fortitude which is an essential quality you need to develop if you're going to follow the Bodhisattva Pact and become a Buddha. Okay, that was not what I wanted to hear. What I wanted my teacher to say is, yeah, I know Sam, he's a really difficult person. But you were there, and you did your best, and you tried your best, even though he treated you so terribly. And I'm really proud of you for, <laughs> you know, staying that long. That's what I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. That's not what my teacher said. So, this became uh, like a big Zen koan to me. How in the world is Sam kinder than the Buddha? Okay, I understand that argument, Rinpoche, but, <laughs> you see, yes, but, yeah, Sam said this, and he said this, and he said this, and he ruined my reputation, and he turned people against me, and he got in my way when I was trying to create virtue, and I'm trying to help people, and he would take my things off my desk and hide them, and then this other one, you know, they, they would ask my permission because I was gegu, and then they wouldn't follow it, and then they all got together and teased me, and they made me cry. One time, I even got so upset, I decided to hell with trying to look nice. I was just going to cry in the middle of the committee meeting because I was so pissed, and they did that, and they did that, they did that, you know? So that was still going on in my mind quite a bit. Yeah, and then chapter six every night. <laughs> okay. So then, after I went back to Nepal and I saw my teacher, then I went to India and I went into retreat. Okay. So I did retreat, I think four months, three, four months, I can't remember. Anyway, it was a solo retreat. Yeah. 
and I was going to do retreat. It was going to be very peaceful, very wonderful. Finally, I get to meditate. Well, what came up in my meditation? How dare he? <laughs> I'm visualizing the deity, I'm reciting mantra, and there is Sam. And then all the others, you know, the ones in the committee, the other monks who did this and this. Every session. Every session. Because I was really furious, you know. I had never been treated that way before, you know. And it was... It was really, um, I, I didn't know at that time all these things about mansplaining and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, those terms weren't invented then. Yeah. And I never, th and I grew up in a, in a household where, you know, I did better than my brother in school, so there was never this thing of women were inferior in my home. And then, you know, it's like... Okay, so every session, there they are. Every session, I'm meditating on chapter six again. Yeah, and I'd calm down, and it would be great. At the end of the session, I'm calm. You know, maybe I did three or four mantra um, <laughs> with some concentration. All the rest was trying to deal with my anger. Then I'd get up in the, you know, from my seat. I'd take a walk. What do I think about in the walk? Sam and the rest of them. Ah, sit down for the next session. Again, you know, can I even get past refuge in Bodhicitta before I get angry? <laughs> yeah. And you know, so my point again here too is you have to meditate on these things again and again and again. And it isn't like even when you meditate on them that your mind becomes completely clear instantly. Because I would think of these situations, okay, like the one time when I was working on a sadhana to get it ready for the retreat. And Sam, or someone, I don't even think it was Sam this time, but somebody else, took it off my desk, and they were going to work on it, but without asking me. And I came in to do my work, and it had vanished, but I was responsible for it. <laughs> okay, so something like that. And I realized, okay, anger is one element in that, but how should I or how could I have reacted? What could I have done in that situation? Because our mind always goes to what could I do? What should I do? So I realized two things. First of all, is don't go to what should I do immediately, even though that's our tendency. First, work on the emotion that is behind it and get yourself calmed down and see what your buttons are. So what were my buttons in that situation? Yeah, what did I need? My button was I was not being respected. And I deserve to be respected because I'm me. And I'm more talented than those idiots anyway. Oh, a little bit of pride. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So... Looking and, you know, what was my contribution? I got to that situation emotionally first. Not what should I do, but first emotionally. How can I get myself calmed down? Okay, 
So there's people who don't respect me. How dare they? You know, the United Nations thing on human rights says everybody should be respected. <laughs> and I'm the first one that they should respect. Why? Because I'm the most important one in the world. How dare they not respect me? Okay, so, you know, a little bit of self-centeredness in, in here, too. Um, yeah. And then, okay, well, why should people respect me? Because I'm me. And they should recognize my good qualities. Mm, I don't think that's going to make a good syllogism. <laughs> I think there's some flaw in my reasoning. Then I would ask myself, okay, well, what are the benefits of being uh, praised? Why do I want praise and respect so much? This opened a whole can of worms because I began to see that my, how much my self-esteem depended on what, what other people said about me and how little ability I had to evaluate my own actions and to have confidence in my own decisions and how little ability I had to acknowledge when I made a mistake too because I needed everybody else's approval and respect and a good reputation so that I could feel good about myself because if people told me I was good I must be good and if people told me I was bad, I must be bad. And they were telling me I was bad a lot. Okay. So that was a whole can of self-esteem worms, okay, that got opened and started crawling out all over my puja table. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so that was something I realized I had to work on a lot. It wasn't just during that retreat. That's been something working on for years and decades, okay? Because that's pretty entrenched. And so learning how to evaluate myself accurately, own my mistakes, have confidence when I see that I've done something with, with a good uh, motivation, and realized that just because people criticize me, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. And just because they praise me, it doesn't mean I'm a good person either. Because what they say and what they think about me are just energy blips in their minds. And it really has more to do with them than it has to do with me. Yeah, and that my self-esteem cannot rest on other people's praise. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing, working. You know, and like I said, I'm still working on that one. So uh, then to continue, I would ask myself, okay, so what, uh, what really are the benefits of being praised and having a good reputation? Well, people will like me. Really? Is that the reason why people like me? Because I have a good reputation? Because other people praise me? If people like me for that reason, it's not going to be so stable. Yeah? Because they're just seeing the outside of me. They're just seeing my act, my, the persona I create of nice, sweet me, so that everybody will like me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually, 
you know, people like me, people don't like me. Does it get me any closer to full awakening? No. Does it get me out of samsara? No. Does it give me good health? No. Does it enable me to hear more Dharma teachings? No. Does it enable me to meet excellent teachers? No. Then what, you know, the things that were really important to me in my Dharma practice, a good reputation didn't provide any of them. Praise didn't give me any of them. Okay. And criticism didn't take any of those away either. And then, in the back of my mind, there was some vague memory. In other words, I deliberately forgot it. <clears throat> of a teaching I heard that talked about the benefits of criticism. Yeah. So you can see why I deliberately forgot it. Who wants to hear the benefits of criticism? Well, I kind of pulled that one out again and started thinking about that. And yeah, there's actually a lot of benefits to being criticized. Because, you know, I had a little problem, little, little problem with arrogance. And some criticism actually did me some good. <coughs> And I remembered that even in sixth grade, people were accusing me of being stuck up. Of course I wasn't. <laughs> but false accusation again. <laughs> yeah. So maybe because I appear to other people stuck up, even though I'm not, maybe I should try and not be so stuck up. <laughs> So criticism was good. It made me humbler. Yeah, It made me more sympathetic to other people's problems. It made me understand bias and prejudice a lot better when you're judged by some outward characteristic like being a woman and put in a category and certain things imputed on you. So the criticism actually was very, very helpful. And it's only over the years that I began to see some of the benefits of criticism. And especially, uh, yeah, how it makes me put my feet on the ground. Yeah, I'm not awakened. I haven't even entered the path of accumulation. Um, I don't even have it guaranteed to get a good rebirth. So humility is um, wise in my case. Yeah. Uh, so I began to really see, yeah, it's, it's good sometimes to face criticism. Yeah. Uh, and so this kind of exploration, yeah, showed me a, a whole different side of myself. It really uh, showed me a lot of things I needed to purify because then, of course, I had to look at how in sixth grade I was stuck up and how I treated other people in sixth grade. And then also I had to think about the karma of why am I getting criticized? Because I have criticized other people. And then I had to think about all the other people I criticized and why did I criticize them and how mean I was to other people. Okay? So there was a whole lot of stuff that came out of that experience that has, you know, been slowly <coughs> unpacked over the decades. And there's still more in it to think about. Okay. So really working with that. And then, after some time went on, to think, okay, 
then to get to the issue of, well, what could I have done in that, in that situation? And I realize now that um, the primary thing I could have done in those situations where I was getting put down or criticized or whatever is first deal with my anger and be able to sit there and listen to what they're saying and assess, is there something true in this? If there's something true, I need to work on it. If there's something not true, I don't need to get all bugged out about it. And then, uh, you know, I also can make my own feelings and needs known without any expectation that they'll hear them or act on them. But I can say in those situations something to the effect of, you know, I would like some respect or I have a certain responsibility to finish this project. I would appreciate if you have qualms about what I'm doing that you speak to me rather than take my work, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I would appreciate some good communication. How can we, you know, maybe have some good communication here? Yeah, and so then I got to how, how could I have said, you know, what could I have said? And I think here the nonviolent communication was very helpful in helping me understand that, okay? But the first thing was to be able to be calm in it because when I wasn't calm, then I was going to say or do something that was actually going to inflame the situation because the more the macho guys tease you and the more you react, the more they tease you. Yeah, and the more they, you know, they get a certain kind of glee from it. But, you know, looking back, I think that it still was good that one time, you know, because before I had always tried to suppress it, that one time where I just cried in the middle of the community, in, in the middle of the meeting. It's like, okay, that's the effect of what you're saying. I admit I'm hurt. Yeah. I admit I'm upset. Here it is. And I'm not ashamed of it, and I'm not trying to inflict it on you either. Okay? But, again, my point in telling you all of this is that it needs a lot of repeated work. Okay, so you have to remember the antidotes and then go over them many, many times. And use many, each, each affliction has many different antidotes. Try out different ones. Yeah, try out different ones. See what works for you. If there's still... <clears throat> situations where you feel really uncomfortable, yeah, even after you've seen what your part in the situation was, what we might have, you know, contributed to the chaos, us sweet little beings, yeah, what we might, just might have contributed to it. Um... What else, what else I did that really helped was I thought, I, when I would imagine the situation again, I would put Vajrasattva in it. And either, you know, I would think I'm Vajrasattva. How would Vajrasattva act in this situation? Or here's somebody, you know, screaming at me. I put Vajrasattva on their head and said the mantra, and imagine Vajrasattva's light, 
you know, of wisdom and compassion flowing into them, purifying their mind, calming down their upset, calming down their afflictions that are making them do whatever it is in the situation that is uncomfortable. Yeah? Or transforming everybody in the situation. Poof! Everybody becomes Vajrasattva. Yeah? So your your whole family dinner, woo! Everybody's Vajrasattva. <laughs> yeah? Your mom and your dad and your siblings and, you know, the whole nuclear family. <laughs> they call it nuclear for a reason. <laughs> yeah? Um, you know, the whole thing gets purified. And you're all there becoming Vajrasattva chanting mantra. And that really helps a lot. Because it helps us remember that the other people in the situation are not cast in concrete. Yeah, That there's sentient beings who have the Buddha potential, <coughs> whose minds are changing moment by moment. Yeah, And so... You know, they're not going to be like that forever. In fact, they're not even going to have that body forever, and we're not going to have that relationship with them forever. And so let's clear up all this bad feeling that we have so we don't take it into the next life with us. And so then forgive and here's another whole process. Forgive. What? Forgive what they said, what they did. This is, I am traumatized for my whole life. You know, I have PTSD because of this. Okay, I'm not making fun of people who have PTSD. Yeah. But I'm saying that we solidify things in our mind and then those things we solidify torment us. If we remember impermanence, if we remember emptiness, if we think that other people can change, if we can remember that our own feelings can change, that if we can remember that memories are only memories, they are not things that are happening now. That the people in our memories are not the same people right now. Yeah. How they acted then, who they were then, is not who they are now. And who I was then is not who I am now. So let's forgive everybody in the situation, you know, and loosen things up here instead of making everything so tight. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is another thing that is involved in purification. Yeah. And it can... Uh, it can reveal a lot of things to us and really help us a lot to look at emotional habit patterns we may have had during our whole life that continuously create problems for us. And in this, I'm including habit patterns of how we interpret certain things, the meaning we impute to certain situations thinking that I am not imputing anything, but that this is an objective reality. But looking at it a lot and seeing what are the habits, what are the emotions, what are the situations I, I repeatedly encounter, and how is my interpretation creating those situations? By what details do I pick out and emphasize and create a story about? You know, and then we realize, oh my goodness, 
I'm picking out certain details and making the story all about how I am tormented by other people who don't appreciate me, who criticize me unnecessarily, who un are unfairly biased about me. Blah, blah, blah. Me, the victim. Yeah. Who's making me into a victim? I'm making myself into a victim. Nobody else is making me into a victim. Yeah, I'm doing it by how I interpret the situations. Yeah. So this opens another door, you know, and if we can start to change these kinds of uh, patterns of how we interpret things, change the patterns of our emotional responses to things, yeah, we can really purify a lot and prevent ourselves from creating a lot of negative karma in the future. So we have a, two minutes left for questions. <laughs> So just to say out loud one of my takeaways and, and check it is that in reality receiving praise really does nothing for us moving along the path. But actually receiving criticism opens up a lot of opportunities for us to move along the path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it shows us what we can work on. Yeah. Yeah. Gives us compassion. Increases our renunciation of samsara. Yeah, go ahead, Naya. Um, Venerable Seppel, in the first day, mentioned this, and you alluded to it just in this talk um, about considering looking at your own circumstances to evaluate possibly what maybe some of the afflictions you need to work through are. And I was wondering if, and it doesn't have to be right now, or if you can point me to a text to look at, but for some of the more obscure, non-virtuous actions, say, like, coveted, well, I don't know. Some of them are more obvious, like, what the result might be, whereas others, it's not as clear, like when you said, mm -hmm. um, if people are criticizing me, maybe I've criticized people, but for some of them, I don't think it's as direct or clear, like, covetousness, or, you know, like, different yeah. things. Could we learn a little bit about the results to consider that, or is there somewhere I could look to find that? Yeah. I think um, the text, The Wheel of Sharp Weapons, which is the book Good Karma, yeah, I think I found that one um, perfect, in, um, very helpful in, in pointing out different behaviors and different attitudes. Yeah. Because Dharma Rakshita, who, who wrote that book, he, he doesn't play around. <laughs> he points our stuff out right there. Okay. Uh huh. Can you pass it back? I'm just curious do you think that your teacher sent you to Italy to, because they saw something in you that they wanted you to learn a lesson about? Very possible. <laughs> I think they needed somebody to, to do those jobs, but I think they figured that it might help me as well. How old was I? I was uh, 28, 29. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went trouble. You had. I hope you had a wonderful time in my country. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is more of a personal uh, thing, which I, uh, as you spoke, uh, which came to my mind. So I have my grandmother. So who believes like okay, uh, she is so nice to people. They take her for a ride and take granted each and every time. And I ask her, you know, can't you see that they are taking you for? A ride? Can you hold the mic close yeah. to your mouth? Yeah. So I feel so uh, anger, angry looking at people taking her for so granted because I love her so much. And she would be like, oh, don't worry about it. God will take care of them. 
and he was like what the hell <laughs> i understand f- 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 one time is a mistake second time okay but every single time i have become so anger and so frustrated and uh on me especially not on the people because people are people but on my grandmother that she is not learning anything from her mistakes that people are taking for uh, granted i i don't know how i pu- uh, but she is so calm and is like don't worry about it and that pisses me more <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, it, okay yeah. so uh, but it seems like she isn't disturbed by it yeah but i am so disturbed <laughs> that yeah that's my <laughs> but, but she she's content being the way she is and she's content helping people it makes her feel good yeah true but for i <laughs> i'm not trying to argue i'm just trying to put my point across uh, it's just that i love her so much but i hate being uh, taking her for granted okay so what is something that i can do to get this out of because she's okay. so happy and i am not <laughs> that's the point <laughs> that's the point okay um one thing is to look at what your mental standards are that you've set up that constitute being taken for a grant uh, taken for a ride or take taken advantage, advantage of yeah, yeah? and really look at what you've set up as your criteria and realize that those are coming from your mind that criteria they are not objective out there they're coming from your mind yeah and that you feel taken advantage of when certain things happen yeah because you have those standards and so let alone your grandmother being taken advantage of you're being taken advantage of or you know you get upset when you're taken advantage of and then just look at her generosity you know i don't know your grandma but it sounds like she's a very generous person you know and that she gives just freely and feels good about it even if someone comes back and asks for more she's okay and she feels happy and so um spend some time rejoicing in what a kind and generous person she is and how much merit she creates by having that kind of kindness and generosity and then go back to your standards for what being taken advantage of means and try and revise them yeah loosen them a bit yeah yeah sure. thank you and let me tell you yeah. one story too there's a book called tattoos on the heart and um it was written by father boyle, boyle. boyle. yeah gregory boyle. gregory boyle right and he was a catholic priest who was working in the barrios in los angeles in areas where there were gangs and he knew all the families he knew the gang members you know somebody was sick he'd take them to the hospital they needed groceries he'd take them here and there and uh you know the, some of them were gang members and somebody once said to him a uh, father aren't they taking advantage of you and he replied i've given my va- advantage away yeah that's something to think about you know another living zen koan what does it mean i've given my advantage away because in although it appeared to other people that they were taking advantage of him he didn't feel that way he had given his advantage maybe of you know we could look at his life what advantage he had he had given that away but he had given away the mind that was always uh calculating what have i given to other people and what have they given to me and has it been a fair exchange 
Yeah, because that that kind of mind can make us uh, feel it taken advantage of. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's sit for a couple of minutes. Just to remember what we heard and then we'll dedicate. <laughs> 